Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tamina Joffrey, and I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Yorkville University. I want to welcome you all to Yorkville University's Social Justice in Higher Education panel discussion. We have an amazing lineup of of a panel of scholars from the Masters of Education program who will be discussing the role of higher education in advancing social justice in broader communities. They will be examining the, the strategies to rehumanize teaching and in um, learning and assessment and leadership and discussing possibilities for decolonizing education and cultivating culturally inclusive praxis. This is a really important and timely discussion that we're having and learning opportunities like these are one of the many opportunities and important steps that Yorkville University is taking to help us embed more diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, decolonization and social justice into the classroom and beyond. Our hope is that each speaker will have about five minutes to situate themselves and their work. And after about 25 minutes, we will have an open discussion where you can unmute yourselves and feel free to join the discussion if you wish. You can also use the chat function if you feel more comfortable posing your comments or questions like that. I would now like to invite the chair of this panel, Dean of Faculty of Education, Dr. Ellen Lyle to guide us through today's event. Thanks so much, Tamina. I appreciate the introduction and, of course, your support in um, bringing this panel together. And I'd like to thank everyone, uh, the panelists and attendees, for joining us today. Um, a commitment to social justice is not so much about a collection of actions as it is a way of being. Even as we planned this panel, we found ourselves looking to each other as we struggled how best to acknowledge the spaces we inhabit. Respecting the advocacy truth and reconciliation intends within land acknowledgements, even as we hear how the practice is sometimes problematized, we continue to seek possibilities to walk together in a good way. Wanting to be transparent about this struggle as we endeavor to move forward with respect, we begin our panel with Dr. Lois Edge leading us in an expression of gratitude set against the backdrop of our institutional land acknowledgement. So uh, we respectfully acknowledge that Yorkville University campuses are situated in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous nations. We reaffirm our responsibility to increase awareness and understanding of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and of colonial legacy, and we commit to strengthening our relationship with Indigenous peoples throughout Canada. Um, next slide. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, good morning to those of us who are here in Alberta. Danse nito temtik. Wapis kagageo mehia nitsigaso kiwitnok utsinia. I would like to acknowledge the homeland of my ancestors, the Dene of Dene Da, people of the land land of the people, where my maternal French Nehiao Apitao Gosasan Denetso Liné and paternal Dinju Scots and British ancestors have lived for multiple generations over thousands of years on Turtle Island. I'm from the north, uh, raised at Tabacha by the rapids of the drowned on the Slave River at Fort Smith, Northwest Territories. I currently reside at Amiskwatseo Waskahigan on the traditional and ancestral territory of Treaty 6. I am a mother and a grandmother. This is an image of my granddaughter taken last winter out back of our home on Wilderness Road at Fort Smith. Currently situated elsewhere, we lament and long for the river, skyline, peace and quiet, fresh air, and most of all, sitting with the trees, listening to bird song and raven's wing overhead. Children who grow up close to the land over time experience and embody freedom in a manner as remains inaccessible. 
elsewhere. During my learning journey in higher education, I've come to know education as freedom in privilege and responsibility as a radical space of possibility, citing the late bell hooks. Next slide. Indigenous education in higher education is increasing primarily in response to calls to action by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and more recent ratification of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. My role at Yorkville University is teaching Indigenous perspectives in Canadian education in the Master of Education program. One of the things I love about my work is the opportunity to actively engage with a broad spectrum of learners, educators, and professionals from diverse backgrounds holding multiple knowledges and perspectives. Noteworthy is a majority of students having minimal, if any, prior foundational knowledge specific to Indigenous peoples in Canada. This is the challenge. The challenge of not knowing about First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples, descendants of the First Peoples of North America. Uh, next slide. Intentionality is key. More than two de decades ago, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People extended an invitation to those in attendance to, across the country to gather together for a common purpose, stating, when gathering together for a higher purpose, power is generated when people use a good mind to come to one mind. Folks were encouraged to approach the day with a good mind to speak clearly and honestly with each other, to listen carefully to what is being said. For when people come together for higher purpose to deal with difficult issues, one's mind must be clear. Guided by Indigenous systems of knowledge, my role as an educator is to create meaningful space within which to introduce Indigenous worldviews and perspectives, ways of knowing, teaching, learning, doing, being, and life ways to critically examine processes of colonization, decolonization, indigenization, and reconciliation, to celebrate indigenous cultural resurgence, self-determination, health, and well-being. Next slide. Contemporarily, Indigenous scholarship encourages building of relationships, taking the time to get to know one another, to engage in critical reflection, to be creative, inspired, and flexible, to be mindful of preconceptions, assumptions, biases, and attitude, to be mindful of not knowing, sensitive to underlying tensions grounded in shame, anger, guilt, fear, and grief, to practice love, empathy, kindness, and compassion, to acknowledge and accept power and privilege, roles, and shared responsibility in enactment of self-determination as social justice in higher education. In closing, I would like to share the guidance of Denis Soline, Elder Francois Paulette from back home, encouraging people to acknowledge and accept the window of opportunity we are given to inspire peace and harmony in difficult times, to stand up for our children's future, embrace ancient knowledge, connect open hearts and minds, earth and spirit. Masi Cho, thank you for the opportunity to share my practice in Indigenous education as social justice in higher education with you today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lois. Um, I really appreciate the work that you continue to do in, in guiding us all forward um, in respectful and, um, and kind and compassionate and conscious ways. Our aim here today is not to dictate to others what their practices ought to be, um, but to be a, a little bit more transparent and share a bit about our lives and our lived experiences as examples of the work that we do to support most more socially just learning contexts. 
Our hope in sharing how we move our work beyond words and out into the world is that in our practices, you might find possibilities for your own. Acknowledging that lived experiences write themselves on us in both visible and invisible ways, I request your indulgence as I introduce myself. I am the second daughter of three, born to a teacher and a farmer. Raised on an acreage nestled along the banks of Mulpec Bay, I grew up wandering the margins between land and sea, attentive what each had to teach me. And as I left the well-trod ground of this familiarity, I promised myself that I'd take its wisdom with me. For the last 20 years, I have done this, hoping to contribute in some small way to the growing consciousness of how our ways of being inform our ways of knowing. I've done this from a place that understands teaching and learning as deeply personal endeavors, even as they are profoundly relational. And in that relationality, I recognize what resides as our potential to foster more inclusive and equitable practices. As such, creating space for individual and collective humanity is not a discretionary option. It is an ethical imperative. That cultivating spaces for the co curricular inclusion of lived experience is both personal and political. It chafes against those well established systems that continue to exalt some perspectives while marginalizing others. Successfully facilitating such a pedagogical shift requires a personal willingness to bring forward what we ask of our students, the courage to pursue critical consciousness with the aim of developing a social conscience that compels us to do better by each other and by the world. Next slide, please. In higher education, we are uniquely positioned to drive social change through teaching our teaching practices, through our scholarship, and through our leadership. My own work in classrooms is guided by valuing the lived experiences and respecting the integrity of individuals. Listening deeply to each other fosters voice and agency while encouraging us to seek meaning in our learning even as we collaboratively inform its development. This generative approach uniquely encourages accountability. In co-constructing learning, students and teachers share ownership of the pedagogical experience. This way, teaching is dependent on both students and teachers having a sense of efficacy and trust in those entrusted. This trust is cultivated through a continuous and longstanding advocacy for socially conscious practice. As a scholar, I've spent the last number of years conceptualizing research projects that bring other scholars together to speak about identity, social justice, relationality, rehumanization, all within education. Each peer-reviewed collection is thoughtfully developed to include diverse people and perspectives, as well as distinguished and emerging scholars alongside community practitioners. As an academic administrator, I have the privilege of leading a truly excellent faculty, every member of which is passionate about the capacity of education to advance socially just societies. Through curriculum committee, faculty council, program advisory committees, hiring practices, student feedback, we come together to individually and collectively seek possibilities to improve representation, culturally responsive pedagogies, assessment efficacy, and resource allocation. I think I'll stop there for right now and circle back to some of these specific initiatives in closing. Um, but at this point, I'd prefer to um, defer the mic to my colleagues so they can speak about their important work. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is Andre Robinson Neal, and I currently reside on the lands of the Serrano people in San Bernardino, California, and I'm originally from the land of L the Lenape people in southern New Jersey, and so I bring you greeting. Um, my focus for learning and teaching rests in the educational leadership arena. I've worked in education for almost 30 years, ranging from specialized pre-college programs through master's and doctoral leadership training in education. Through those experiences, I came to a better understanding that leadership is more about walking alongside people rather than walking in front of them. Even figuratively, leaders who put themselves as the head of all conversations do less to advance the practice than those who engage with others and together help formulate great ideas that move the organizations forward. Next slide, please. 
My experience in education as a student, a faculty member, and an executive leader have enabled me to work in a variety of environments. It is the privilege of working with people from various spaces that fostered my love for equity, diversity, inclusion, and access. Since the 1990s, I've been a champion of these initiatives, seeking to support the voices of traditionally marginalized individuals and people groups through work often in underserved communities. My volunteerism and community service has also connected to this work. For example, I spent several years as a board member for an organization dedicated to urban revitalization and renewal, as well as community activism and engagement, which is something that I stepped away from, but am again becoming more involved in more recently. Next slide, please. And for going on eight years, it has been my honor to serve Yorkville University as an associate faculty member in our online Master of Education program. I've spent this time offering my educational leadership experiences as a lifelong learner and professional and sharing not only from my research agenda, but from uh, my sort of own personal process of uh, from narrative inquiry to share stories and experiences as well from just everyday life um, to bring together the ideas of space, place, and personhood to provide facilitation in several of our courses. I also support students nearing the end of their master's journey as a supervisor and second reader. And I've also had the honor of uh, walking alongside Tamina as part of our um, diversity initiatives here at the institution. Many of the students who have entrusted me to walk with them toward completion of their degrees have done research related to shedding light into and bringing a sense of scholarly balance to the value and importance of diverse voices in the academy. And it is my continued honor to spend time listening to their stories and helping them craft those into um, strong academic products that not only they, but our institution can be proud of as well. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for attending today. And I turn it over to my colleague. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Joy Polanco, Casino Polanco O'Neill. And I like to read a story, a narrative to you to start out um, a little bit about myself. It's also published in an article called An Educating During the Great Transformation, Relationality and Transformative Sustainability Education. So I'm going to share this narrative with you um, right now. <clears throat> I was riding my bicycle to the university where I worked in the Midwest of the United States. Only this time it was after the 2016 Trump election and his campaign promises of building a wall. At that time, Trump said, we have some bad hombres and we're going to get them out. These statements were a dog whistle to an already volatile situation, igniting fear and uncertainty for immigrants. My mother is a, immig a Mexican immigrant. My father, born in a Nazi labor camp, is an immigrant too, from Poland and Russia. I happen to look more like my Mexican side of my family. As I was riding my bike, a man stuck his head out the window of his pickup truck and yelled, go home where you belong. I looked at myself and thought, do I look Mexican today? As I headed to my class, ironically, a course on social justice for educators, I suppressed what I had just what had just happened and talked from outside of myself. I grasped onto my whiteness in these situations and carrying on as if I belong. I dare not share my experiences with my students out of fear. I would further exasperate the lack of belonging I felt. Trump's recent policies and rhetoric intensified the awareness into a reality of fear. While not plausible, my fear of deportation of immigrant families, like my own, was felt. My parents raised me intentionally not to speak my mother tongues or knowing too much about my past to obscure our minority identity they perceived was needed to be successful. But you can't take away appearance. I tell myself, it's okay, I'm a chameleon. But what about my students, my colleagues, my friends, my family? who can't explain away cam or camouflage their appearance. Dare I imagine a world where I do not need to be a chameleon. Thank you. Next slide, please. 
a lot of the story or the narrative shared a lot about my work that I, I do and who I am. So um, I will jump into my lens and, and my intersections and the importance of intersectionality and the multiplicity that we are in our work that we do. Um, in my case, in this slide, I have the uh, professional aspect of who I am, of being in a tenure track faculty member and affiliate professor with Yorkville, working in the courses as um, transformative learning and social justice and education. Um, but really what's important to me in the slide is the latter three or four uh, topics, which is a climate justice advocate and adult learning uh, working in that arena. But more importantly is my grounding as a granddaughter and a grand uh, and a mother, I'm sorry, a granddaughter and a daughter of farm laborers from both sides of my family. It wasn't until later that I realized this is where my roots were, is why I'm interested in social justice and sustainability and how to build the just future. Next slide, please. So my work lies in building a just and sustainable future in higher education and adult learning, but it is through educating in order to build a just future. So a lot of my work focuses on um, looking and interrogating our current Western paradigm of teaching and learning and leadership, which is on the left side in the picture indicates what that might look like. And then I focus on how to build um, education and teaching and learning in the classroom and in uh, workplaces and how to uh, think about multiple ways of knowing and collective decision-making, transformative learning, relationality, complexity, holistic learning, and how to bring affect and our emotions back into the um, arena um, in which we are uh, weaved together as mind and body in, in one. And that's my uh, introduction today. And thank you everyone for listening and being with us today. So Peter, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Joy. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Sepide Mohani, the Associate Dean and the Chair of Education Leadership Program here at Yorkville University. Um, I'm joining my colleagues here today to talk about culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy, which is engaging in a pedagogical approach that actually recognizes that in order to promote a more nurturing learning experience, educators must ensure they offer opportunities to students to connect their cultural background to the content. My interest in the topic of cultural relevant pedagogy has stemmed from my professional and personal experiences, both as a student and an educator. My parents immigrated to Canada from Iran um, when I was a very young adolescent. And on the first day that I started school here in Toronto, on a cold January morning, <laughs> like today, I realized that along with the new language, I was about to learn a new culture that was very different from my own. Even at a young age, I realized that the stories I read in books and the topics that were discussed in class were very different than my culture at home. A few decades later, I moved to the United Arab Emirates, where I taught Emirati women at one of the largest higher education institutions in Abu Dhabi. Shortly after starting my position there, I learned that UAE's post-secondary institutions were aspiring toward international accreditation, which is why majority of the curriculum was imported from Western countries. And as instructors, we were expected to teach using packaged and imported curricula that overlook the cultural context, the knowledge, the religion, and the skills that the Emirati students brought to the classroom. It was during my time in the UAE that I started my research in this field in an attempt to making my teaching culturally relevant and responsive. The image you see here is of Sheikh Zayed Mosque in Abu Dhabi, where I lived for over 12 years. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what is culturally responsive teaching and how does it cultivate equity, diversity, and inclusion in the classroom? Culturally relevant and responsive teaching and pedagogy, also referred to as CRRP, 
is based on two bodies of work by Dr. Gloria Lanson Billing and Dr. Geneva Gay, and both were founded upon the experiences, um, sorry, both were upon the experiences of black students in the US, knowing that the educational system was failing them in many ways. CRRP is about honoring students' identity and diversity and helping them accept and affirm their cultural identity while developing critical perspectives that challenge inequalities in our society. It is a pedagogical approach that states in order to promote a more nurturing learning environment and a more nurturing learning experience, educators must ensure they offer opportunities to students so that they could connect their cultural background to the content. It is closely tied to critical social justice and recognizes that there are oppressions that exist in the society. And in order for us as educators to really move students forward, we need to recognize these oppressions and address them in our classrooms. It is about pushing back dominant ideologies while at the same time helping our students move forward. Next slide, please. So to be culturally responsive educators is more than just being respectful, sensitive, and empathetic. It is about accompanying actions, such as incorporating cultural characteristics, experiences, perspectives of diverse students in the curriculum. It is about providing opportunities for students to integrate their experiences in their work. And it's about making learning relevant by encouraging them to connect their backgrounds and reflect. In the MED program, um, we are committed to promoting social justice as my colleagues have already explained. Uh, we do this in our curriculum, in the way we practice and deliver our courses. These are some of the strategies that we use to ensure our curriculum and learning spaces are culturally relevant and responsive. In our courses, we encourage critical reflection components, which involves collective dialogue among students and instructors. We encourage reflective practices to encourage students to reflect on their existing biases. We encourage students to reflect on social inequalities and critique discourses of power. We make learning contextual and encourage students to leverage their cultural capital. We use diverse reading materials and resources created by diverse groups of scholars. We use diverse resources to plan and structure engaging learning opportunities and revisit them regularly to ensure they are current and relevant. We offer alternative methods of assessments. And finally, as educators, we acknowledge that our students enter the classroom carrying an assortment of beliefs, which may include racial and cultural prejudices. And as educators, we help combat prejudice and racial disorder by supporting positive behavior among all students and fostering a sense of belonging for all students. Thank you for being here and thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Sepede. Um, uh, just as we look to, to round out our um, discussion today, I hope we've given you a sense that uh, at, in our faculty, our focus is on students. We wanna support their learning journey, assist them to reach their goals and to celebrate their ability to leverage education to change lives in their communities. We recognize and value the rich experiential knowledge that brings students to higher education. And we're committed to cultivating learning spaces that position their experiences as co-curricular. In an effort to live our values congruently within our practices, we have implemented several initiatives to advance socially justice, just education. We deliberately seek diverse representation in our faculty, also in our course contact, content and in our resource allocation. In addition to our hiring practices, which explicitly seek applications from qualified candidates from underrepresented groups, 
Our program advisory committee has been consciously appointed to advance equity, diversity, inclusion, access, and decolonization. This commitment extends to our courses, each of which explicitly encourages pedagogical practices that work to unprivileged Western ways of knowing and seek to include cultures of orality, two-eyed seeing, arts-informed inquiry, elder knowledge, holistic epistemologies, culturally relevant pedagogies, as well as place-based and eco-sustainability perspectives. We're currently redeveloping our assessment metrics to advance efficacy and inclusivity. And in December, I'm delighted to say that we developed a revised faculty review process that seeks to decolonize a faculty performance assessment. We'd welcome any questions on these or other initiatives, and we're eager to hear from the attendees about their experiences or questions they may have for us. But before we move to open mic, I think our president would like to say a few words as well. Over to you, Julia. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, let me acknowledge that I, I come to you um, from the ancest uh, ancestral lands of the Attawandran people and the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, it is indeed my absolute honor and privilege to be president of, of Yorkville University. I am so impressed um, by so many of our programs and really see um, the, you know, Ellen's leadership in our, in our Masters of Education and the wonderful faculty um, who, who support this work. I really think it's absolutely exemplary. Um, I did just want to share a little bit about my own background. I came to this role just six months ago. So I, I'm the newest member of the call and, and I come from the University of Guelph, where I was the founding dean of the Lang School of Business and Economics. So you might think that some of the concepts being discussed today uh, would be a little foreign to me, but I, I wanted to share um, from my own research how I too come to this work. Um, my, the, vi the vision of the Lang School of Business was to be and develop leaders for a sustainable world. So we put a lot of focus on um, sustainability and transformative leadership. And I'd also done um, research on academic integrity in higher education and in a previous leadership role, I was president of the Society for Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. And I recently had, had the pleasure to work with Sarah Eaton from the Workland School and, and revisited some of my earlier thoughts on leadership and sustainability and integrity. And, and in a book that um, will be published through Springer um, this spring, I had the opportunity to explore some areas I hadn't, hadn't thought of before. When I, I was thinking about leadership, I was thinking about higher education and its role in the world and integrity. And I ultimately wrote a chapter called Academic Integrity Across Time and Place, Higher Education's Questionable Moral Calling. Often when we talk about academic integrity, we're thinking of students and the behaviors of students. But in this chapter, and I just want, want to quote it to get it exactly right, I wrote, tracing Western higher education's development from medieval times in Europe through to the US and Canada, I make the case that the academy has paradoxically been both a dominating and liberating force since its inception. While imposing Western conceptions of morality and truth that have shifted over time and supporting the imperialist ambitions of church, monarchy, monarchy and state, higher education has also elevated its privileged graduates to positions of influence within society and advanced national aims. Despite credos of truth telling and missions of character development, higher education's moral calling has been and remains highly questionable. Given the complex challenges the world is facing today and the need for Canadian institutions of higher learning to confront their colonial roots, it is time for us to critically examine this history and explicitly reposition integrity and diversity, equity and inclusion at the core of Canada's higher education institutions. So that was work I was doing before I came to Yorkville. So why was I attracted to Yorkville? It's exactly because of the conversation that has been 
um, initiated here today. The purpose of the stated purpose of Yorkville University is to be the top choice for students seeking personal and professional trans transformation through higher education in our areas of focus. And of course, education is a key area of focus for us. So what, what you've heard um, through the presenters and the kind of conversation they're hoping to engage in with you now is, is what, what is the call for all of us um, to continue to enhance accessibility to higher education, to provide an education that is not imposing singular and misguided notions of truth, uh, but is truly engaging and liberating and providing an accessibility that will truly usher in um, a, a new time for higher education in this country. So I'm, I'm so proud of the work um, that was happening at, at Yorkville long before my arrival um, to, to Ellen and the team for their profound commitment, for their true leadership uh, in advancing the, um, the kinds of issues that they've raised and, and a commitment to truly transforming the student experience. So um, Ellen, I think at this point, I'm passing it back to you, um, but just want to, to add my welcome and the university's commitment to continue to listen hard and to work hard um, and, and to be leaders with, within higher education in the country. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julia. Um, I appreciate your, um, your continuing support of the initiatives that we do and what I uh, have been just delighted to see as an overwhelming consistency uh, in your own leadership as we continue to try and do the hard work and um, the brave work, I think, of advocating for change. So I think at this point, we have about 23 minutes left on the clock for those who are able to join with uh, as for like a Q&A period. Um, but more than just uh, questions, uh, we'd like to open up the floor for dialogue. So Tamina, oh, I was just gonna say, why don't we lose our, our background of our slide and just um, open up the floor for anyone who'd like to speak with us. And I know that there have been a few questions um, sent to us in advance, maybe for people who either uh, were uncomfortable in being on camera to ask us questions directly, or perhaps just wanted to make sure that they captured their thoughts. So, um, so I guess, Tamina, at this point, if it's okay, I'll just pass it over to you to moderate. And, um, you know, we'll hop in. Any questions that come forward, uh, we'll just uh, divvy them up and respond as we think is most helpful. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ellen, to all of the panelists and to Julia as well. Um, it's definitely been extremely insightful listening to each one of your presentations and learning more about how we can um, implement culturally responsive pedagogy. So I'm going to open up the floor really to anybody who either if you would like to um, speak or if you want to add any questions in the chat, you can please uh, feel free to do so. I do know, as, as Ellen mentioned, uh, that Oh, we've got some awesome comments from Don Zeman, who's one of our faculty in our MACP program. Thank you, panelists um, and Tamina for this wonderful presentation and thank you for sharing this with us. Thank you so much, Don. And, and I know there's a lot of um, participation here from our various of our programs and our faculty and our students and staff and, and even um, externally in our community as well. So I wanna thank you all. Um, so does anyone in particular have any questions that uh, you wanna start us off with? I think Mary Drinkwater, um, if you wanna go ahead, Mary. Hi, Tamina and, and Ellen and the colleagues that presented today. And thank you for, uh, again, a wonderful presentation and a really good overview of the great things that are happening in the Faculty of Education. One question I had when Ellen mentioned, and this is, again, something new that I haven't seen happening in other um, universities and in other faculties of education, is this push to to bring the equity, diversity, inclusion, decolonizing piece into faculty assessment. So I'm interested if someone could speak a little bit on what Yorkville is doing in terms of looking at decolonizing faculty professional assessment because that or performance assessment. That's something very unique that I haven't seen other institutions doing. 
Thanks, Mary. I appreciate the question. And I apologize that uh, you're going to get a more fulsome and robust conversation about this on Tuesday at our faculty council meeting. Um, but really where this came from was in the process of our regular regulatory review, uh, we do kind of an audit of all of our documents. And through that process, we recognized um, the consistent efforts in trying to move forward in equitable assessment. Um, you know, I think for eight, 10 years, uh, certainly since uh, my memory of being in this institution, we've worked at consistent hiring practices, but it occurred to us as we looked at our review documents, wait a second, we're still holding our faculty accountable from a performance perspective based on very traditional Western colonial um, assessments of what it means to be successful. So when you dial that down, we were trying to assess people on what a SEOC says or a student assessment of, of um, teaching does at an end of course survey. And we were really only counting um, the dialogue around peer reviewed conferences, peer reviewed conference proceedings, peer reviewed context uh, as far as papers or tiered journals. And it occurred to us, what about all of the incredibly important community-based work, um, advocacy work, where I think the rubber really meets the road. So what we did, and you'll see that when you get to go through your review process this year, the entire document where it used to be about um, reflect on, and we gave you, you know, kind of the stuff, whether that was uh, your research publications, et cetera, everything was mapped against a very traditional metric. The whole document has been formulated uh, to be called a faculty's year in review. And it's meant to be dialogic where you can talk about the work that you've brought forward community-based or peer reviewed, um, work that you're doing in partnership, work that you're doing to actually advance contexts in your own community, in your own classrooms. So we very consciously have prioritized on an equal playing field what we have always said mattered. Um, and now we're going to assess our faculty in our annual review process in a very consistent way. Does that answer your question? That is fabulous. And it, it'll be nice, uh, hopefully down the road within uh, a year or so, we'll write a paper because I think that's a great model that other institutions could, could uh, benefit from, from hearing about. Can I jump in here real quick too, Helen? Yeah. Enjoy. Another thing I think to be mindful of too in those assessments is uh, a lot of times we're, as we're pushing the envelope to, to explore different ways of teaching and learning in our classrooms as educators, our students might not always be ready for it, but we get, you know, student evaluations are such a large part of assessments as well to ensure that, um, that we have that capacity and that space to be able to challenge how we teach, especially um, from diverse colleagues who are really trying to push, push that into um, different ways of exploring that and being able to ensure that our assessments, assessments are in alignment with, with um, being able to do that, especially when you're not a tenure track faculty member or you're kind of worried about your position and where you are in the world as a faculty member to, to have that um, assurance that we can practice and, and push our students a little bit into these explorations. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Just one question that we had in the chat, which I think Mary may have answered indirectly in her um, statement, but Ellen, someone is asking whether uh, this new faculty review process or the decolonizing um, faculty performance uh, process would be able to be shared externally as well with others. Yeah, I mean, we're happy to share everything that we have. So um, if somebody wants to just uh, connect with me in email, we're happy to show the work that we're doing. Um, and, and while, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily offer a branded template of what we use internally, I'm happy to pull all of the sections out of that that we use, because I think that the more that we share the work that's being done, the more change uh, that we're able to create. So short answer, absolutely happy to share. Thank you for asking. Email me and I got you. Excellent. Um, so I'm just going to uh, pass it over to Cassandra LaRose, who, uh, who has a question as well. So much. This has been wonderful. So I am a new librarian, um, just recently finished my master's uh, working at Royal Roads University uh, in Victoria, BC, which is the lands of the uh, Quisepsum and the Lekwungen peoples. 
And I'm wondering as a new librarian whose role is scholarly communication, so I do have a bit of a portfolio where I can help to showcase student work, instructor work, faculty members, research, um, but I don't necessarily have much of a budget. Um, I come into classes and I do instruction. Um, I'm wondering what I can sort of do um, to support faculty when I think a lot of our work traditionally has really been about um, very sort of hard research and hasn't necessarily considered social justice. I think I'm at an institution that cares quite a bit about highlighting this, but as a new instructor, um, librarian coming in, it's a bit, I, I want to make this a part of everything I do. And I'm just wondering from your perspectives, if anyone has any sort of thoughts on this. Um, an immediate thought that I have, and I know my colleagues may want to as well, that um, I'm responding from, uh, I think a perspective of leadership in that uh, acknowledging that there's a, particular tentativeness or caution that may accompany our journey when it's at the beginning. <laughs> so I just want to say from a leadership perspective, um, embrace your agency, because no one in a conscionable, conscious environment, and Royal Roads is one of those, um, will want to quiet, hush, derail, erode, or stand in the way of socially conscious approaches. So when you frame yourself in that way, um, I think you've got great capacity, not only to move forward in your own praxis, but to help advance the praxis of other new, but also longstanding scholars. And in some ways, it's a real privilege to be at the beginning of your career and already have identified that because you don't need to rebrand who you are. This is your commitment and this is what you want to do um, from institutional uh, resource perspective. And there's all kinds of creative ways that you can do that, particularly if you're looking to decolonize or indigenize curriculum, because that is one community that has done a brilliant job of creating open access research. So you're not limited by budget. Um, so I think that the very fact that you're asking these questions and having these conversations, you're already farther ahead than you think you are. Um, but don't apologize for the work that you're doing. Um, tread lightly uh, in, with care and with, with caution, but never with apology. Um, I think that this is really, really important work that you're doing, and it takes courage to be shiny and new as you proceed in this pathway. So, so thank you for it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, I think Jennifer Kahn also had uh, a question. Jennifer, if you're there with us. I did. Thank you. I wasn't sure. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm in the MAC pro ACP, sorry, program, not education, but I have a strong passion for education and social justice. Um, I believe it was Joy um, had made a comment that something uh, that is really resonated with myself, my previous work experience profession was nursing and I was a facilitator um, for the nursing program in Ontario uh, and have really come to this place of this moral dilemma of the expectation of what I'm to bring to others are to bring to what it to, to teach your students uh educate appropriately the importance of social justice um ethics the morality all of those pieces but joy when you mentioned that it really hit me um your bike riding and what had happened but when you got to the classroom uh you're basically keeping that to yourself so othering that piece of yourself and keeping it in to prevent exposing your students to that. Uh, and I guess this is just an area that, that I sit in where, and I, I forget the name, I'm sorry, but the Dean that had mentioned this as well in terms of ac the academic world, academia and how there's changes being made. Um, and if this is something that you do see moving forward within those that provide the services. So those that are instructing are basically the leaders of, uh, of the programs, like 
being able to live what we are teaching, if that makes sense, within the program or wherever you may work or the agency that you may work for. Yeah, I'll just jump in there because as I was uh, reading or, you know, the, that story, it kind of is a little doom and gloom. I left you hanging with like, what do I do? So my, how do I do this now? And um, that's why I'm here. And that's what I do. And I share that story and it's recorded. And it's like, so I'm, I'm definitely in a process of, of saying, um, I, I need to share this moment. So, mm -hmm. I know. so I learn from it and then I can um, build from it and hopefully share it with others that, um, but then, like you said, there's, it's a space, like right now we're creating this really great space and um, Yorkville's done a wonderful job to be able to expose and share who we are in our, in our work that we do here. And so it, it's, I think it's a, it's a, it's a space that, that is mutually created, not just seeing, I'm going to throw myself out there and be, because we have to protect ourselves too and slowly um, uh, be able to expose or share um in a space that we're comfortable with doing so so i appreciate this panel even too just to be able to have shared and grow from from that and how to you know navigate that myself okay thank you awesome um so one of the questions that we did get beforehand if there's nobody that uh wants to uh, chime in right now was around um, promising practices and decolonial reconciliation. So is there any um, ideas around those types of practices that educators can learn from when attempting to indigenize the curriculum? Over to you, Lois. Um, well, that's a that's a really big question. Uh, promising practices in uh, decolonizing curriculum, is that? Is right, that right, and in indigenizing and decolonizing curriculum. Uh, well, I think um, turning to uh, indigenous uh, voices um, would, be, would be the first space in the first place, uh, accessing knowledges as, as shared by uh, in indigenous scholarship. <clears throat> excuse me, by Indigenous uh, scholars, uh, leadership, uh, elders, knowledge holders, uh, community members, uh, professionals, um, following um, mainstream media uh, specific to Indigenous peoples in Canada, CBC Indigenous uh, is an entry point at the level of the individual in terms of, of what's happening um, uh, and where and, and, and how and so on. Um, bringing uh, uh, Indigenous speakers uh, into courses, into classrooms, really the integration of Indigenous content uh, into uh, programs of study, uh, curricula, um, and, and courses. Um, and, and we have a really long way to go um, across the country, specifically in this regard. Um, there's a few, uh, there, there's you know just sort of a handful of courses that have come into being specific uh, programs of study at various uh, universities and, and colleges. Um, you know, oftentimes um, in the uh, enactment of uh, strategies of, in, of indigenization that have been um, developed, uh, you know, at the uh, by leadership uh, in collaboration uh, with in, indigenous uh, leadership uh, and community members uh, as well. Um, you know, just um, like I said, intentionality, you know, what is your intention? Um, you know, opening a heart and mind, um, entering into with, you know, the, the learning space uh, with, it, with, uh, with an open mind and, and a clear mind. Um, yeah, being, in, being sincere uh, in terms of one's uh, energies um, as rather than, you know, approaching um, indigenization and decolonization in the context of indigenization as, as one more item uh, on, a, on a checklist. Mm -hmm. if, if I could add to that, um, I, I, just one wonderful response. Thank you, Lois. I, I would suggest that it's e even as practical as the design of our classrooms. And you know, do, do they, I, I love the image that was shown earlier, sort of the Western notion where you know the expert is the front and and the room suggests every the student's job is to sit in rows quietly and listen versus how do we create collaborative spaces um, 
that sort of where the hierarchy is is uh, you know distributed uh, as sort of shared learners. That's one way. I also think in terms of assessments and in including attribution of work. Um, so in in the book I mentioned previously, we have a couple of chapters there in terms of really honoring oral traditions. You know, I think in in the west in the Western tradition, we've got this notion of intellectual property and our citation practices are so um, so specific. Well, we need to decolonize that as well, right? And and really value oral tradition. And, and we need to be clear and welcoming of, of different ways of, of, of bringing that knowledge um, in, into academic work. So there are just a, a couple of things that have been on my mind as well. I'll just add one thing, uh, Tamina. Absolutely. Uh, as, as a first step to be mindful and considerate of decolonization of oneself at the level of the individual in terms of our thinking and moving beyond the, the, limit, the parameters, constraints, and limitations um, as imposed uh, upon us and as exist within each um, premised upon um, our active engagement within the context of uh, colonialism and, and colonization where each one of us are, are participatory and complicit within and to be aware and mindful how you know how can I as, a, as an individual uh, practice uh, decolonization. I think that's really point. Yeah Lois and just to jump off of um, what our, our president said and, and Lois is is that classroom experience to be able to ensure that um, students in this space have uh, uh, opportunity and instructor to be vulnerable and to build mm -hmm. that trust to be able to ask the questions of how do I do this, what is it, and just really again build in that environment to be able to um, to, to be have a vulnerability and, and know it's okay to have those conversations. Wonderful, thanks so much. Um, I'm definitely going to get to everyone with their their hand up, but I just want to give Hillary Leeton a chance to chime in. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just thinking here as we're talking, um, you know, inclusivity, it, we are talking so much about humankind. And um, I'm, I'm very interested as an eco-psychologist to bring in all of the other peoples. <laughs> you know, I would say, you know, plant peoples and tree peoples and sky peoples, and, and that might sound indigenous. Um, it aligns beautifully, uh, you know, eco-psychology and indigenous indigenous thinking that it was it came from there it was born of of of, uh, of those early relationships with all of life and so I think if we leave out these other relationships this context of which we're a part which I saw in the beautiful diagram of course included in the sacredness of water and I heard also Andre talking uh, so much about um, you know other ways of um, of, of bringing like our effective um, ways of knowing. So tapping into all these intelligences of the natural living world, uh, you know, our ancestors, uh, also bringing this in an effective way um, because there isn't often room for that. We say, oh, go reflect in your journal and do it on your lunch hour. Well, you know, to specifically bring something into the curriculum, to, to bring ways of bringing our body, our souls, ourselves into curriculum and honoring that, giving it full space as much as we would for our beautiful rational minds. I think that's something we're standing in on and continuing the discourse in and you know, uh, for many years, it can seem like you're on the edge <laughs> or, you know, on the uh, margins if you're, you know, uh, speaking this way. And I think now there's an appetite for, um, you know, this kind of uh, opening in our pedagogy. I can see the sun is starting to illuminate me, so I'm <laughs> going to stop, but, you know, here we go, illuminated. Anyways, thank you for doing this, you guys. I, I would like to stay and chat with you all day and have tea, so thank you. We will do that, Hillary. We absolutely will. 
Um, and, it, you know, I just want to respond uh, both to you and to the group about the capacity to bring this actually into our classrooms and in our curriculum. And I know it won't be unfamiliar to you, the notion of a body of work where we can theorize our form and then write on ourselves through decoupage or art, um, a, a creative narrative about how we've come to be in our teaching and learning lives. That was an important lesson that you taught me through your scholarship a couple of years ago in one of your publications. And it's actually um, an assignment option in our curriculum as living inquiry. So the work that we do matters. Um, and I think as long as we're open to learning with and through each other, um, these types of richness of relationships and exchanges help us all to be more. Um, so I appreciate you joining the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Lovely to see you. <laughs> and you. <laughs> I think Andre had a comment. Um, did you want to chime in, Andre? You're saying you're speaking about personhood? Sure, sure. Um, you know, just to kind of follow up on that comment that, you know, particularly as we're all sort of dealing with, you know, what I've come to lovingly call the Hollywood squares, right? You know, we're spending every day, whether we work online or not, you know, in these boxes. And so how do we bring our personhood into those spaces? And I think that we all here at Yorkville try our very best to do that in that, you know, kind of back to Joy's point of, you know, telling our stories and, you know, the narrative opportunity, sure, words on a page or words on a screen are very important to what it is that we're trying to get across. But to bring that into the now and into our spaces and having our students do that kind of speaks to even the flipped classroom idea. What is it that students are bringing to us and how can we then sort of feed off of that to provide them something that helps them make the bridge between those words on a screen or words on a page to what it is that we do. And even the, the question our colleague asked about, you know, library resources and without, you know, having funds, you know, the, the big joke always is, you know, Google is your friend, right? That, you know, Google Scholar is our friend in academia in many ways. And as faculty, you know, we kind of have, have to have a keen eye on that when students want to bring things in. How do we encourage them to do that? Um, I was actually not here at Yorkville, but having a conversation with some colleagues um, in a classroom recently, and I told them, I want this class to be fun. It's an ethics class. I mean, how dry can you be, right? And so we're talking about all of the things that are going on in their communities, things that I would have no way of knowing because we are globally dispersed, just like we are here at Yorkville. And so giving them the room to bring those stories in to sort of backdrop or support or buttress the works that we have on our curriculum leaves the space open for that and sharing our own vulnerabilities and so forth. So, you know, if to, not to say that it was a question that came from our colleague, but for those of you that are thinking about resources or how do we do that, we don't have to. We, we've got a big wide world of students out there that will bring all of that to us. And if we open the door as faculty to say, yes, yes, we want it, you know, we're hungry for it just like you, it allows them that space to feel valued and to bring in their world where we may not be a part of it. And then it gives us the opportunity to go and be Sherlock Holmes and perhaps let Google Scholar be our friend to learn more about their spaces as well. So thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Andre, for putting that spotlight on the receptivity uh, on our part as well and on faculty's part and on the administration's part. So I really appreciate that. Um, I, I totally see your hand, Mary. I'm going to get to you. Don't you worry. But I want to go to Ziyang, if you don't mind, because I just want to give um, some people a chance who may not have asked yet. So uh, Z, if we can go to you first. Hi. Uh I, I just want to say hi to Dr. O'Neill, Joy O'Neill, who was my professor, director, uh, the director of the program that I was in, also was my dissertation chair, but she said something about creating a space for her students. And I just remember in one of her classes, she had created a great space for all of her students to really tell their story. And it was just, it was just so much appreciated. I just remember so many of us crying because we heard each other each, each other's stories and how much we connected with each other so i just i just wanted to say that and and um what she said earlier really resonated with me sharing her story but also finding the right space for it thank you thank you so much c for 
for your insights. Um, before, I'm just gonna go to Kimmy. I know Kimmy, you haven't had a chance yet either. Um, Kimmy? Um, I, I'm just coming from a different perspective right now. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very new student to Yorkville University uh, starting uh, my MED. And uh, this, first of all, this um, webinar was extremely insightful and very reflective for me um, and very refreshing. And I'm listening, listening to a lot of the uh, faculty talk about, you know, bringing all this culture and diversity into the classroom. And I just want to say, I, I know I'm, I'm new at Yorkville, but you are definitely doing that and you are doing a fantastic job. And, and, and just as you are hungry to bring our experiences into the classroom, I think you are making us even more hungry uh, to hear them from our peers and um, from our faculty as well, from your faculty, sorry. And uh, I, just, I just wanted to thank you for this. Um, this was really, really, really fantastic. And I'm super excited to, uh, to continue and learn more from you all. Thank you. Thanks, Kimmy. I'm sorry we haven't had the pleasure to meet yet. I do remember seeing your file in admissions <laughs> and I'm oh, delighted yes. you started. <laughs> Some admissions and something else might have crossed your desk recently too. So no, it's it's all good. And thank you very much. I do I do appreciate the feedback. We're quite sincere, and we say um, we really look to our students to teach us to be good teachers. And we're all here because we all care. So I'm glad that so far so good. Um, and we're here if you need us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kimmy. That's wonderful. You know, who else to really reflect back um, the changes and the transformation uh, that's coming from this direction than, than you as the student. Um, so I'm going to go back to Mary. Uh, Mary, if you have a question. Sorry, Mary, you're on uh, mute. Just building a little bit more on Lois's comment and on Hillary's comment and on Lois's comment about um, drawing on, bringing in Indigenous voices, students, elders, community members. Um, the one thing that we have to be careful of, that we're not drawing on individual Indigenous students within our classes, or bringing in elders or any other community members as a form of extraction, because otherwise we are continuing our colonization. So it's Again, going back to Ellen's point, it's about relationships. It's really important building these relationships, understanding our relationships as settler individuals, um, seeking out how we can be good partners, allies, co-resistors, co-conspirators working together. So that's very important. And then on Hillary's point, I really loved it because, again, this connects to my work as in Africa in Indigenous uh, knowledges and connects really well to Ellen's point about relationships, Ubuntu and Cosmo Ubuntu. So humanity relationships and relationships with non-humans. The work of Jose Cosa, Yusuf Wagid, and Vanessa Andriotti. Um, again, if we're thinking about relationships, lots of places we can go in our curriculum and our courses. So those are two little, little points to build on those. Thank you, Mary. 100%, thanks so much, um, Mary. Ziang, did you have uh, another question or, because I see your hand up. Are you, you're good? You're, no, it's not, okay, so it's down. Thank you so much. So I think we have um, maybe time for one last question. And one question that did come up that I think um, was, was mentioned in uh, Sepide's presentation and perhaps other presentations was around alternative um, assessment techniques. So I guess I'm just trying to throw this out to the panel. Have you ever been in a situation where you had to innovate and accommodate different identities and needs when it came to assessment techniques? And maybe if you can tell us a little bit about your experience and what that was like. So I, I want to get out of Sepeda's way so she can answer this, but there is a story and I'm the storyteller and I try not to be long-winded, but um, very recently in our faculty, 
Um, and it was in Reflexive Inquiry, which is a course that's near and dear to my heart. And um, I wasn't teaching it in that particular iteration um, that I was teaching a curriculum course instead. But I did have a, a faculty member who came to me and said, you know, I'm struggling with how to grade this assignment. And this is what led eventually to our revisitation of all of our assessment practices. Um, and I said, okay, well, talk to me about what, how you're struggling. And she said, well, I'm looking at the rubric and, and these are the things that we have to do. And she had a whole list of like boxes to check, but this, the assignment itself um, was to engage in a reflexive process that demonstrated critical and social consciousness within your context so that you could, through an awareness of bias and positionality, untangle a moment of disconnection and understand where that disconnection came from so that you could advance praxis. And the student um, participated in a ceremonial tobacco ritual, spent a course of over a period of 10 days um, in um, a, a meditative uh, engagement with tobacco, with ceremony, with elders, as she tried to interrogate or understand um, what her own experience had been. And then she wrote about that experience and did it beautifully. The faculty member recognized that she did it beautifully, but none of it fit within the boxes of the essay that the student was supposed to submit. So what we did is have a conversation with the student, um, with the faculty member, and with myself as administration, where we talked about how do we authentically live our commitments to EDIAD um, inside of our assessment practices, if indeed our assessment practices privilege a particular way of knowing. So what came out of it was a negotiated understanding about how did we meet these learning outcomes and now we're revising all assessment metrics in all of our courses. So I, I think I, I wanna share that story because again, it points to how our students teach us how we can open more spaces. And I think it demonstrates the courage and the humility of the faculty who reach out and say, I don't think I've learned as much as I thought I did. Can someone help me learn more? So I, I just share that because I think it's a it's a real example of the ongoing process to to pave the road by walking it. So uh, to borrow from Friere. Uh, so thank you for the question, and um, I know some of my colleagues may want to to jump in on that as well. But thank you for allowing me the privilege of answering. Yes, thank you for the question. If you don't mind, Ellen, I'll just jump in. Um, so yes, different ways of assessing students, really just giving an opportunity to students to showcase their learning uh, in non-traditional ways. Um, I remember when I was a student in university, it was just paper after paper, uh, and uh, you get tired of writing, uh, and you want to get a chance to really tell a story without, uh, as our president say, you know, within the following APA and, uh, you know, following traditional ways that the, we've been all exposed to. Um, so yes, we do provide uh, different options for students to showcase the learning, and this can be through um, artistic performances, poetry, storyboards, um, incorporating different visuals and presentations, uh, you know, uh, presenting photo collages uh, and so forth. And um, as um, our Dean just said, we are in reviewing, in the process of reviewing a lot of our assessment metrics uh, to ensure that at least um, the students are given a chance in every course uh, that out of the two assignments, they have an option of uh, presenting their work differently, uh, their assessment, you know, being assessed differently and not just in a traditional uh, essay format. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sapire. So I'm going to hand it back over to Alan because I think we're uh, just out of time uh, just to wrap everything up. Sure, I can do that. And I see more hands up. So I'm so sorry to have to, um, you know, succumb to the timekeeper. But I know that um, we're here on channel for 75 minutes, and we have only a few minutes left. So what I would like to do first and foremost is thank everyone for taking the time today to come and join us in this conversation, for trusting us to have the conversation in the first place and for being open um, to our continuous learning journey uh, and then maybe to walk along it with us. 
Um, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues. Um, I just, uh, you know, people are so generous in saying that, you know, the work that we're doing in the Faculty of Education is, is you know, quote unquote, good work or important work. Um, but it's easy. It's easy work to do when you're surrounded by good humans. And I just count myself so blessed because every day I am surrounded by good humans on both sides of the metaphorical desk. So um, thank you to my colleagues for joining me here today and, you know, come in on another wild and crazy ride. So, uh, so thank you for that. And um, I guess, uh, of course, I, I want to thank the university for, um, for supporting us in being able to bring this work forward um, in a different way, uh, even in, you know, our, our kind of um, maverick attempt at not wanting to do a webinar. No, no, it must be a meeting and everyone must be on camera if they want to and everyone must have voice if they choose to have voice. So um, to the university, thank you for playing. Um, really appreciate it. If any of you have questions, we're all very accessible. We're highly Googleable. So just get our emails, get in touch with us. Um, we consider you all a part of the community. This is a journey that is ongoing. Um, and we don't have all of the answers. Um, we don't even have half of them. So uh, what we have is a deep commitment to working with other people to find answers that might work right now, where we are here on this part of the journey. So um, thank you. Thank you for showing up. Uh, thank you to my faculty um, for just their continued awesome humanness. And thank you to Mina for supporting us and moderating. And I'd also, um, I know I've thanked Julia. Uh, I, I'd like to do that again. Thank you, Julia, for your leadership. And Aaron, I know you're hiding in the background making all of these magical things happen. So to Aaron Hatfield, our Director of Communications, you rock, we appreciate you, and thank you for your support. So I wish you all good health and good spirits and be in touch with us. We look forward to adding you to our community.